Good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining today. And today we're going to celebrate um, Black and African-American scientists, engineers, and inventors and the contributions they've made in material science and engineering. Um, today's webinar is hosted by the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Penn State. And we'll have a number of volunteers today to highlight the contributions of the scientists. Um, but before we start, um, Professor Enrique Gomez is going to give um, a little background and highlight last year's webinar. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for organizing this year's webinar. And I just wanna spend a couple of minutes highlighting last year's event and just as a quick list of the folks that we went through and highlighted last year, I have this slide here, right? So we talked a little bit about Garrett Augustus Morgan, the basically the inventor of the three light stop light, you know, red, green, and yellow, as well as smoke hoods, which were precursors for things like gas masks. Betty Washington Green, who was a polymer chemist that basically developed various clever approaches for stabilization of latex expansions, now used for coatings and paints and so on. Frederick McKinley Jones, who did a lot of pioneering work on mobile refrigeration. It was actually used, um, for example, in, in the, for to prevent spoilage of food during transport, as well as, for example, in the battlefield, um, the, the the use of um, to be able to transport things like uh, plasma and, and other um, important uh, materials. Uh, Paula Hammond, who's done a lot of work on basically establishing layer by layer assembly. It's a very useful technique and, and development in biomaterials as well. Carlton Trustdale, who did a lot of work on ion exchange of alkali free glasses, particularly for chemical strengthening. Kate Lorenzen, who's basically the pioneer of regenerative engineering, a lot of work basically on tissue printing and, and development of um, artificial tissues. Reva Buchanan, who's a, a a pioneer in electroceramics and has basically written many seminal textbooks on electroceramics and crystal chemistry. And Walter Lin Lincoln Hawkins, who basically invented uh, plastic insulation for telephone wires. And that was absolutely critical, for example, for the widespread use of things like uh, for, for, for communications. Ronald McNair, uh, who, was, who did a lot of work on laser physics, but then went on to become an astronaut for NASA. Um, Annie Easley, who is a mathematician, and as well as a computer scientist, an early computer scientist who did a lot of the work in terms of developing code for things like energy systems and hybrid vehicles, um, as well as in uh, rockets. And uh, our very own Quadro Seosare, here in material science and engineering at Penn State, who's done a lot of work on aqueous extraction chemistry, hydrometallurgy, interfacial and colloidal chemistry, self-assembly, among other things uh, that he's pioneered. So I encourage you uh, uh, to check out last year's webinar here. We, I have a couple of links, our website, as well as a direct link for YouTube. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about these various folks. But now I'm very happy to you know, let the program move forward so we can hear about 2022's webinar on Black and African-American scientists and inventors. Back to you, Rob. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It was nice to see the highlight from last year's. Um, and so this year, um, our first, presenter will be Professor Amy Robinson, and she's going to talk about Dr. Michael Williams. Thank you, Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so I decided to share about Dr. Michael Williams today. Um, he is actually a, a colleague of Susan Sinnott, and she spoke very highly of him, and so I wanted to highlight him today. Um, Michael is the department chair and professor of physics at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so Michael attended uh, Morehouse College and received his bachelor's in physics um, back in 1979. And in the same year, he also received another, another bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from Georgia Tech. Um, from there, Michael moved on to Stanford University where he got his uh, master's and PhD in physics. And then he went to industry and spent some time at AT&T Bell Laboratories. There he did a lot of work with um, in-situ determination of chemical and electronic properties of multi-layer stacks of dissimilar materials. 
that were grown using molecular beam epitaxy, and he specialized in Reed, Auger, and photoemission spectroscopy in characterizing these materials. Um, after his time in industry, then uh, Michael moved to Clark Atlanta University uh, back in 1995, and he's been there for approximately 27 years now. Um, Clark Atlanta University is a rather small, historically Black university, um, one of the first ones in the southern United States. Uh, they have an enrollment of about 4,000 students, and they're an R2 university. Um, there, Michael is, again, a professor and a department head in physics, and the physics department focuses a lot of their energy and research into understanding the fundamental properties at the surface and the interfaces of optoelectronic materials and developing those materials for electronics and integrated optics. Um, some of his additional research um, specifically for Williams is focused on understanding the surface and interface of epitaxial films and semiconductors specifically looking at the physical processes, growth morphology, the interfacial strain at those interfaces, and the change in the electronic structure at the interfaces. Um, most of his recent work has been looking specifically at growth morphology and processing of 2D metal dichalcogenides. Um, during his career there at Clark at Atlanta and, and his previous um, Stanford and, and AT&T. Um, Michael has over 122 peer-reviewed journal articles, um, many of them looking at um, electronic materials and specifically different um, characterization techniques of those. I highlighted just a couple of these. The first one was um, understanding the sticking of oxygen on a platinum 111 surface. This is one of his highest impact um, research articles, so I wanted to share that. He also spent a good bit of time looking at um, epitaxial graphene and understanding how fluorinating epitaxial graphene can allow you to manipulate the um, chemical, physical, and electronic properties of graphene. And more recently, um, Michael has been looking at improving the data and analysis that you can get from secondary ion mass spectroscopy. Um, this article here is specifically for looking at silicon and gallium nitride, but he also has several other uh, material systems that he's been studying. Another thing that um, Michael focuses a lot of his time and energy on is service to the American Vacuum Society. This is actually how Susan um, got to know Michael. He is currently the president-elect for AVS. Um, he has been the director of AVS. He was an AVS trustee. He was the liaison for underrepresented minorities, chair of the diversity and inclusion committee. Um, he chaired lots of different AVS chapters. He's seen um, or oversaw the rejuvenation of both the Texas and Tennessee chapters. And he's also oversaw the addition of four separate student chapters in Alabama, Central Florida, Washington, and UCLA. So Michael has had some nice impact in both um, his research as well as his service to material science. Great, thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Venkat Gopalan. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you for organizing this. It's a lot of fun um, learning about these very inspiring uh, uh, scientists. Uh, and today I have I've picked Martha Euphemia Lofton Haynes. Uh, she was the first African American woman PhD in mathematics from Catholic University of America. Uh, and this was back in 1943. Uh, we are in material science. It's a very cross-disciplinary field, and mathematics is one of the languages we speak to in order to describe uh, physical phenomena around. And um, she was born in 1890, okay? Very different times from our, our current times. She was daughter of William S. Lofton and Lavinia de Lofton. William uh, Lofton was a dentist and a financier, and Lavinia was a kindergarten teacher 
and uh, uh, Euphemia Haynes was a high school valedictorian. She went, got a degree from normal school for colored girls. So this was a different time, as you can tell. Um, but now, today, that normal school is called the University of the District of Columbia. So, and she had a role to play in that, as you'll see. Um, and she went on from there to get another degree, uh, this time in Smith College, as a math major and psychology minor. Um, and then you can see that she she got married, and then then she uh, uh, taught. She she taught first graders. She taught middle schoolers. She taught high schoolers. Then later on, she went on to be a university professor. Uh, but before that, she had to come back. Uh, this is 1930 now for a master's, and then by 1943, a PhD. So. Uh, she's by 1943, you can see she was born in 1890. She is 53 years old. She has already had a lot of service all centered in District of Columbia, Washington, DC, but she has come back to get her degrees and, and pursue her passion. You'll see this puts her in, in another plane of service and impact. So her thesis, by the way, was the determination of set of independent conditions characterizing certain special cases of symmetric correspondences. Um, okay, next slide, please. So um, uh, her, her biographer, Maria Mazena, says Haynes contributed quite grandly to the education system of District of Columbia. So you can see what she taught for 47 years. Like I said, all the way from first grade to high school, she was the chair of the math department. And then this normal school for colored girls is now the University of District of Columbia. And she established the math department there. So she goes back there and establishes a math department. I mean, in those days, as you'll see later, there were track systems and uh, you know, often all the disciplines we take for granted were not available, but they were more into the sort of uh, getting a job and trying to make a living sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, she establishes the department. Uh, she writes a book on edu math education, the historical development of tests in elementary and secondary mathematics, published by the prestigious University of Chicago. Um, and then by 1960, so you can see by now she is 70 years old. And now she has reached one of the, you know, she has worked hard to get to be the chair of the DC Board of Education. And this finally, you know, unleashes in her all, all of the higher level impacts that she's gonna be able to, you know, that today we are going to be, uh, we, are, we are enjoying. So next slide, please. So as uh, the chair of the education in the District of Columbia, she leads the charge to desegregate Washington DC school system. So she was the person you can thank for that. Um, there was a track system, like I mentioned before, where um, you know, based on some initial semesters grades, the black children were put on vocational training rather than going being, being able to go to college and get degrees like we do, uh, so that they couldn't really break out of you know poverty and slavery, um, so a life of servitude. And she felt very strongly about that to the extent that it went on to, uh, as the Hobson versus Hansen case in 67, and uh, which uh, ended the track system in Washington, DC. Um, she also got bargaining rights for teachers that changed a lot of their work environment that they were able to bargain for. It wasn't always this nice as we take for granted today. And, um, you know, her service profile, I had to drop out maybe another half a dozen uh, things here, but you can see she was extremely active. You know, she was active in her church, Archdiocesan Council of Catholic Women, National Social Welfare, DC Health and Welfare, United Service Organization, National Conference of Christians and Jews, Catholic Interracial Council, National Urban League, and WACP League of Women Voters. AAUW, -A -A American Association of University Women, 
Pope John Paul XXIII awarded her the Papal Declaration of Honor for all the services she has, she had, uh, she has contributed. She became posthumously in 1998 AAAS uh, fellow. Uh, she donated $700,000 to the Catholic University when she died, you know, they established um, a professorial chair and a student loan program with that. There is a charter school in DC named after her, E.L. Haynes Public Charter School. And uh, the Catholic University also has an award for outstanding junior mathematics majors named after her. So incredible life of great brilliance, uh, extreme odds, but she left an impact. She left things behind better than what she found them to be. And that's really what the inspiration, thank you. Thank you, that was really nice. Okay, our next speaker is Ifan Chu. Hi, hello, can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah, okay, uh, hello everyone. Today I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to Dr. Susina Heidi. Uh, who is like a famous scientist in the field of the energy materials. So Dr. Uh, Susanna Heidi is like born in the capital of the Etheria, uh, the capital of the Etheria and then moved to the United States at the age of 10 with her parents. She received her uh, bachelor and the PhD degree uh, from MIT in the material science and engineering, and also a master's degree from the UC Berkeley, also in the material science and engineering. And uh, right now, like the, she is a professor of the material science and the chemical engineering at the Northwestern University. So in a very like early stage of her research career, Dr. Heidi is responsible for the creation of the very first uh, uh, solid acid fuel cell, which will convert the hydrogen gas or the natural gas into the electricity directly and uh, leaving water as the only byproduct, which is very environmental friendly. And in the very recent decades, uh, Dr. Heidi and uh, her research group has tried to like use the solar uh, solar heat to transfer the water and the di carbon dioxide into the hydrogen gas or the natural gas, uh, which like very exciting because it it can be a very like a brand new way to uh, turn into the sunlight into our like. Uh, uh, the renewable fuels we use uh, like every day. Um, besides like this can and this kind of like findings or research has like just to help her to win uh, like the international prize in the ceramics back in the 2012. Uh, besides like this uh, findings in the fundamental of the research, uh, she also like the equally emphasize on the like her like the social impact of her research. She like in one of her interviews, she said that I have always thought like the science and the engineering should be devoted to the societal good. And he also pointing out that her key to the success is always to find the most urgent problems in the uh, society to solve. And then she thinks that it is very important for the, uh, the next generation uh, education. Could you just move to the next slide, Rob? Yeah, therefore she just decided to kind of like take the lead and help to build up a nonprofit, a nonprofit uh, organization, uh, highly uh, minus academy. And the, their, emissions, um, their emissions here is trying to set up a model school uh, in de de developing countries. And then they, start, they just decided to start it from Ethi Ethiopia. And uh, uh, in HMA, all the students from the grades nine to 12 are encouraged to ask any questions they have and trying to like encourage us to build like the, to design any hands-on experiments and trying to solve the problems. And they are also encouraged to uh, kind of like uh, to find out what the questions they can find or they can find or they can like solve for their communities or like the, or, in, or even in the world. And the doctor highly said that, uh, like, uh, not all, a lot of girls uh, will have the chance to study the STEM majors uh, back in her childhood. And she also believed that the high, this highly minus academy will be a great opportunity uh, for the young scholar, especially for the girls in the Europe here to find their 
uh, passion and their um, potentials in their lives. That's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jensen Sevening. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, as Rob said, I'm Jensen Sevening, and I'm going to be doing a brief introduction on Mary Elliott Hill. Uh, she was born in 1907 in a segregated community in uh, North Carolina. So as with uh, many of the other uh, uh, scientists we've heard both this year and last year, uh, there was a lot of challenges in breaking into the scientific community um, as an African-American. And Mary Elliott Hills, one of her primary goals was to combat this. Uh, so she found a strong fondness in teaching. Uh, but before becoming a teacher in 1929, she gained her bachelor's degree in chemistry at the university or, or the Virginia State College, which is now Virginia State University. Um, after earning this degree, she began to teach at both the high school and uh, college level uh, at Virginia State College and at the Hampton Institute, Institute, which are both historically black uh, universities uh, or now universities. Um, while teaching, uh, she spent her summers earning a master's degree at UPenn, and she is believed to actually be the first ever black woman to earn a master's of chemistry uh, achieved in 1941. After this, she began to teach as a professor at uh, Tennessee um, A&I College, uh, where her husband actually was the dean. And after working here, she then moved with her husband uh, to Kentucky, Kentucky State College in 1962, um, when he became the uh, president of the university. Uh, she moved with him to focus on doing research and continuing to teach. Um, so if you want to go forward, Rob. So yeah, her primary focus, uh, she was an analytical chemist. Um, the Hills Lab together, they focused on um, ketene synthesis using Grignard reagents. A lot of these ended up actually being monomeric ketenes uh, used in um, uh, polymers. So together they kind of helped uh, progress the field of polymer chemistry. Her primary focus, as mentioned, was in the analytical field uh, where she pioneered the use of uh, UV spectrophotometry to track reaction uh, progress. So using her methods, they were able to um, observe reaction kinetics and conversions, allowing them to properly identify and quantify products they were producing, which obviously had been kind of difficult in the uh, past. Um, and then again, as she focused on research, she ended up co-authoring over 40 papers and two textbooks, including uh, the general college chemistry textbook and a laboratory manual uh, titled Experiments in Organic Chemistry, which actually went through four editions. And she instituted uh, student chapters of ACS at a few of the historically black colleges where she taught, including uh, Kansas State University where she spent most of her time. And I, that's pretty much it. Great, thank you. Okay, and um, today, uh, Lyndon Archer is the last um, scientist that will highlight and I'll um, speak about Lyndon. Um, and so Lyndon Archer uh, is currently the Joseph Silbert Dean of Engineering at Cornell University. Um, he's also the James A. Friend Family Distinguished Professor in Engineering. Um, Lyndon got his bachelor's in chemical engineering in 1989 at University of Southern California, um, his PhD in chemical engineering in 93 at Stanford. Um, he did a postdoc at Bell Labs uh, for a year and then from there went on to chemical engineering at Texas A&M um, where he um, started his academic um, as an assistant professor. And then in 2000, that's when he uh, made the move to Cornell University. Um, and then in 2018, he was um, inducted into the National Academy of Engineers. Uh, and so I'm glad to be able to take the time to talk about Professor Lyndon Archer because the research that he does is, um, you know, I've followed it for a while, uh, ever since my my grad school, because um, I've been interested in polymer grafted nanoparticles and he's made major contributions in this area. And, and so what he likes to call them, the nanoscale ionic materials. Um, and so if you took, take a look at the top left, here's the, there's a nanoparticle um, of a certain diameter. 
Um, and what he's actually been able to do is use electrostatic interactions to graft nanoparticles to, to or I'm sorry, polymers to nanoparticles. And so if you're familiar with polymer grafted nanoparticles, um, typically you either chemically bind through covalent bonds, the polymers to the nanoparticles or grow a polymer chain from the nanoparticle. But he came up with this really interesting idea to use electrostatic interactions and, and come to find out you, because of these, you can really load on polymers to the surface. Um, and so you can see um, there's a, a TEM image of the nanoparticles and also these single component systems are very viscous. Um, but what's interesting about them, um, and if you take a look on the right-hand side here, um, these are really a solvent-free nanoscale organic hybrid materials. Um, and because they're viscous, they're also a high modulus. You can make them have high modulus, but they also have high ionic conductivity. Um, and so if you play with some of the chemistry with these, um, the, in this advanced materials article in, in 2010, uh, he added lithium TFSI, which is typically used for lithium ion batteries. <clears throat> um, and you can, you can add the salt into these materials and have high ionic conductivity. But in 2013, um, he had a really interesting uh, article where instead of adding the lithium TFSI salt to the electrolyte, he was actually able to functionalize the particles um, where they could become uh, lithium ion conductors or single ion conductors, which um, the field currently thinks is maybe the way forward for, for, for battery applications. Um, and so this work you know, has, has really given the field new ideas to think about polymer nanoparticle systems, but also has opened up uh, areas of research for Professor Archer into more batteries. Um, and so I highlight this uh, nanoscale organic hybrid materials platform, these NOHMSs, because um, from this work, he actually uh, co-founded the company, this Gnomes Technologies in, in 2011, which is based off the work that I was uh, just mentioning. And um, not only do they have these hybrid materials, but they uh, work and in, in, in look at the batteries and a whole for the elect uh, electrolytes, um, and also um, new advances in battery technologies for cars and, and other transportation. And so um, it's always really nice to see scientists where, um, you know, they, they, they have a really great career where they're doing exciting science, but then that science goes to the next level um, and, and, you know, people can use it. Society now can use it through uh, commercial, um, it being commercialized. So. Um, with that, um, I'd like to thank all of our volunteers, and I'd like to thank everybody for attending the webinar um, and celebrate uh, Black History Month and um, highlight the achievements of all of the Black and African American scientists, engineers, and inventors um, today. So thank you.